Last night I watched a movie with my Nana and my mom. I was surprised by what I thought and felt. This essay is an elaboration of my surprise. The movie was what most art people I know would call bad, and not bad in a good way, like B-horror movies, for example, which are unarguably trendy. This movie was not trendy. By current standards of taste, it had no redeeming qualities. The movie, Ordinary Angel, starring Hilary Swank, is based on a true story. The story of an alcoholic woman who relentlessly fundraises to pay for a dying child's liver transplant. Sentimental, predictable, but also real. Girl, aesthetic considerations are so confusing, as Charlie XCX sings in the song of the same name from her recent album, Brat, which has taken over the internet and which I unsurprisingly love. Bracketed text is added by me, lol. I evoke Brat throughout this essay because of how, like ordinary angels, the album messes with ideas of what's good and not good artistically, how we form our own judgments, and who, at the institutional level, gets to decide what should affect us significantly and what should not. Brat also deals with subjectivity, which I think is the only valid means for understanding art or anything else. Subjectivity is the launch pad for selfless living, for consequential artistic action. As I wrote, phrases from Charlie's songs flitted in and out of my mind, cutting to the quick of my ideas and emotions. I include them where they entered my thought process. Though my thoughts about art have become too complicated in general, my subjective experience is not. It flows and guides me and remains open for me to interpret as memory. It tames and slows my thoughts, infusing them with meaning. They're not good without experience, slowness, and memory. They're not good unless I have time to see how they play out as time passes. What follows is my description of the event of the movie from, the pers from my perspective and how it led me to a realization about my current experience of life and created things. As the opening scenes played, I was condescending and distracted. Hilary Swank's overdone down-home Tennessee country accent, the absurdly hot roofer dad whose daughter needs a new liver banging away at roofs in tight jeans, and with that popular hot guy mustache, heartfelt AA meeting shares and alcoholic table dancing, cancer stuff, I was sitting there on my Nana's couch, barely able to contain my disdainful smirks and scoffs. I was also glued to my phone, deleting and redownloading Instagram over and over again because I'm addicted to it, trying to stop looking, but also obsessed with imagined messages, likes, follows. My eyes darted between the TV screen and my phone screen. My disapproving laughter, barely audible, must have emerged somewhere between the screens and my fiending social media engagement. My mom dozed, bored. Periodically, she'd stir, giving me looks that said, don't be condescending. I'm ashamed I'm still so immature, but so is my mom. <laughs> when she wasn't sleeping, she'd catch my eye and laugh, smile, as the roofer dad cried for the first time in front of his daughters, as Hillary Swank convinced multiple CEOs to make their private planes available in case of a distant liver popped up, as the cute, bad liver daughter beamed behind John Disguised while getting her first, possibly drunk, Swank-administered makeover. Probably about an hour into the movie, my phone got really close to dying and I had to plug it in. I got up from my snuggly spot on the couch and asked my 93-year-old Nana, who just lost her 95-year-old husband, my pa, about a month and a half ago, if I could unplug her iPhone and plug mine into her charger. Of course, she said, always ready and willing to accommodate. In my mind's eye, I see myself shuffling in my bare feet from the couch to the chair where the phone charger sat. I see my stare, beady-eyed. I was then on a mission to sustain my connection to Instagram communications, judgments, and evaluations of quality, social game playing, how I stack up, lol, why I want to buy a gun. <laughs> my focus was squarely on myself, but my self-awareness was nil. My awareness of others even less, though I'd come to my Nana's house to be with her, just to be with her, to watch movies with her because she loves it and it unites us during a hard time, the time after pause passing. Girl, so confusing. Experience is disjointed. When I zoom in like this, analyzing a moment that passed quickly and wasn't overly consequential as it occurred. Why couldn't I focus on my Nana if I was there for her? Why couldn't I let go of my dumb art life, social media, and my phone? Why was I compelled to react ne negatively to the bad movie? Haven't I proved that I know what's good art and what's not? Haven't I proved that I can hold my own artistically in my judgments and in my work? Why is my consciousness so divided, so out of my control? And why do I struggle so much with locating my morality, with behaving in a way that reflects my ideas, my desires, with accepting that behavior? Why can't I even grit my teeth and lie? In the experience of watching the movie with my family, I create my morality by oscillating between one, proving I have good aesthetic taste through disdain, and then two, by denying the importance of taste and setting it aside to be present for my family and judging myself for not doing that. Both moralities are about my self-creation. They're more about my self-creation than about right or wrong action, which I'll return to later. 
With Nana's blessing, I unplugged her phone, an older iPhone, and set it down on a chair with a bright, busy, upholstered pattern of deep blue, green, and pink. I plugged in my less old but still old iPhone and shuffled back to the couch without it. My experience of the movie up to that point had been filtered through my social media engagement, comparison, judgment of others, self-judgment, active communications about art and about who wants to consume, engage me. I'd roiled beneath my presence in my Nana's living room. I don't want to share this space. I want to force a smile. This one girl taps my insecurities. As I snuggled back into my couch, spot and refocused, I noticed in my experience I noticed my experience was different. There had been a shift. Was it in the movie or in me? Was it in my mom? She seemed to be paying more attention. Nana stared straight forward. She isn't sentimental and she notices everything. I knew she'd heard my scoffing and I knew she saw now when my demeanor changed. Normally this would have embarrassed me into being more engaged, but I was very distracted by myself during this time. A transition in the plot from light conflicted action to a revelation of deep emotional wounds and how those drag out play out and hard times had begun to transpire on screen. A montage set to sad music rolled. Hilary Swank had started drinking again. The hot roofer dad was ghosting her and she couldn't see the kids. He hid his crying from everyone except the movie audience, shaking with sadness alone in his bedroom. His hugeness and hotness and mustache made the crying scenes more sad to me. I started to cry around that time. After that, I couldn't stop crying. When the score told me to be sad, I was. I felt everything with the family. I felt uplifted as scenes of the rural Tennessee community coming together to get the bad liver girl into a helicopter during a blizzard so she could finally have her liver transplant evolved on screen. Tears pulled in my eyes and rolled down my cheeks as the big hot dad finally said thank you to alcoholic Hillary Swank as he climbed into the helicopter with sideways snow blowing around him after months of resenting her constant unwanted presence. Instead of laughing at the bad art, I remembered all the times I've needed people and how truly amazing they've been. I've certainly despaired with my self-centered personality. Despair is a kind of increased from the norm, I think, simply because I emphasize my own experience so much. Thoughts about my own despair <laughs> didn't drive my tears, however. Memories came after my eyes were wet and I was in my emotion. My response was instantaneous and visceral. Philosopher Brian Masumi describes this phenomenon in his essay, The Autonomy of Affect, pointing to the primary nature of affect, how it comes before thoughts, as well as to its power in the experience of art. We remember and cling to affective experiences. Intellectual experiences can't compete with affect. Affect supersedes thought and even self-consciousness, launching us immediately into a stratosphere of connected experience through art. What a feeling. Bad tattoos on leather tanned skin, Jesus Christ on a plastic sign, fall in love again and again, winding roads, doing manual drive, everything is romantic. Ordinary angels in a moment with my family who are not art sophisticates captured the essence of my being so much that I'm compelled to return to the moment in this essay. I opened up during this experience. I loved it. I want to think about it again and again. In this way, it's more powerful than any gallery experience in my recent memory. I've always been sensitive emotionally, physically, etc. I remember crying during a Coke commercial while also making fun of how contrived it was in my teens and realizing this doubleness and reactivity is just part of who I am. I'm a live wire and I experience sometimes opposite ideas or feelings at the same time with awareness. I respond to every experience with intensity, mostly by mimicking and then riffing, I think. I would like to dance more than I do because it feels heavenly to me to copy and respond to movements. That's certainly why I like to draw so much. It's moving with the world. My condescending attitude isn't as ingrained, though. It can be prominent. It came from a feeling that I need to be perceived as sophisticated in the art world once I realized my abilities, class, status, money, and education, each of which are meager if not lacking, weren't going to get me very far. I've been counseled many times not to think this way by well-meaning people trying to build my self-esteem, but we all know status matters in art professions. Condescension isn't the way, but neither is faking naivety or in an inability to feel fear or resentment. Practically, condescension is probably an evolutionary stage of becoming a self-sufficient, competent, or professional. The observation that matters to me about this experience, and that made me want to write, had to do with the simultaneous and equal status of my derisive mocking thoughts and the sincere and visceral emotion that led to my tears. It isn't that one state of mind is right and the other wrong, or that one is more real and the other, or that one is better behavior. They're all of the same status within me at the moment of viewing. They both occur. They are both self-creating mechanisms for me in terms of morality, because I, uh, morality, I of the morality I discussed above. But the, by this I mean, 
in both cases, I'm more concerned with who I am for doing either behavior than with how that behavior affects those around me. It's morality that is about self. Contemplating the self-morality is what I do to prepare myself for presentation to and consumption by others. Morality is only one part of this, though it's an important part. It's probably impossible for me to answer questions about affect, thought, the nature of self-consciousness, and morality, especially with all the art I'm making and want to make. So mostly I muse and let my art meander around those ideas. I'm content with musing on those topics in this essay. Taste, though, I feel reveals itself in my experience of ordinary angels. I've long had issues with taste in contemporary art discourse and social settings, having noticed years ago that I could convince myself that anything is good by recontextualizing it in some way, especially if important, admirable people and institutions were involved in the new context. Do it yourself. Imagine Ordinary Angels or any Hallmark-style movie in MoMA or wherever else strikes you as the height of contemporary taste. Imagine a person you admire discussing the bad movie with reverence or interest, maybe calling it a film. You'll see the thing transform likely. It doesn't matter if you like the film or not. What matters is that you could reasonably imagine it taken seriously by others. The art matters less than its viewing circumstances when it comes to taste. I take this for granted, which means I also don't value um, skill especially highly either, though I think it's important, nor do I ever value the number of hours spent uh, laboring with materials or ideas or people, also important but not essential in my opinion. It's sometimes hard for me to accept that my ability to recognize Um, quality in art doesn't emanate from some deep understanding of its inherent value because it feels like it does but I believe in the argument I made above because I see it play out all the time Art's inherent value is a separate question to me and, in my opinion, should be discussed first in terms of private act of making, second in terms of how artwork functions socially, affectively, economically, um, after has left the studio, and third in the relationship between those two scenarios. It's a separate essay. Instead of equating taste with value judgments, consider how it functions socially. What are its effects? Where does it emerge? My experience shows me that taste is something I communicate to others in the social arena. It isn't a private thing at all. What I like isn't my taste. It's my preference. And even then, at some times of life, it's likely affected by what I think others think I should prefer and enjoy. I might privately prefer and enjoy many things that I wouldn't want to reveal to art professionals because to do so would be a demonstration of my poor taste as long as I'm unaware of their poor taste and whether we agree on the real value of some embattled lowbrow creation. Be horror movies, reality TV, memes, porn, any variety of kitsch stuff is up for grabs, but letting on too soon that I'm into any of this could jeopardize my status with a powerful art figure of refined, aka different taste. This scenario reveals taste as a social tool used to communicate a public understanding of trends and possibly personal shared interests. I privately prefer aesthetic experiences that I enjoy. Publicly, I demonstrate taste. I show the world that I've studied the social hierarchy of art systems and can read its language and trade its currency. Taste refers to trends, not to the spiritual or intellectual value of art. Nietzsche makes this distinction in his book of Musings Beyond Good and Evil, part two, The Free Spirit, section 32. He describes the importance in modern human history of understanding the significance of things by their consequences instead of by their origin. If I analyze taste in terms of consequences, I see that it is social. If I analyze taste in terms of origin, in terms of artistic intention, many interesting problems arise, but they all have to do with the private mental experiences of others, phenomena we will never be able to observe. It was Immanuel Kant and his treatise on the relationship between thought and experience critique of pure judgment who popularized the idea that unique mental firings occurring in our minds prior to social experience uh, constitute the pure origins of individual consciousness. Ideas and therefore artistic genius are the product of God-given spark, a pure mind unadulterated by the impure external world. According to this thinking, artistic intention trumps any consequence my art has in the world. My experience of ordinary angels foregrounded my recent thoughts about taste, demonstrating the power bad art has over me, even as I am immersed in maybe sophisticated art discourse and related social hijinks. Maybe the most interesting thing about this experience and the thoughts that followed is that Kant wrote over 300 years ago and Nietzsche about 150 years ago. They're both well-known thinkers. Nietzsche is now popular. 
Regardless, our art philosophy remains Kantian, while our participation in art society is, as ever, about the consequences of taste demonstrations aligning to Nietzsche's thinking. We could make more interesting art and have more interesting art engagements if we emphasized and analyzed the consequences of artwork, its affective power, its social power, over art, artist intention. Nietzsche rightly points out that our obsession with our own minds, our ideas, our experience comes from Kant's thesis that God is causing us in private mental experiences to have inherently valuable thoughts that determine actions, which must therefore carry similar value. This is a view based on Christian morality, which we hardly adhere to in other ways. Nearly 150 years ago, Nietzsche suggested that we might try letting go of this schema for thought. Seems like a worthwhile exercise. I care more about the moving experiences produced by art than anything else, so it's not trivial to me that I can count on one hand the number of times I've been viscerally moved by art in a gallery or a museum. The other times have been in less controlled settings, and they are innumerable. I don't know what this means exactly, but I often feel alienated and unmoved during art viewing experiences I'm expected to enjoy as an art person, professional, whatever it is. I don't know if I belong here anymore. Charlie sings of the music industry, and I might say something stupid. I often think this while in the midst of some inspired revelation while watching reality TV, annoyed at the art world that it never happens in museums. <laughs> Ironically, I feel a simultaneous desire to become a part of my art community in a way that I never have before. I want to participate. I want to share. I want to be fully present. I want to understand my fellow art people, to leave my own mind with its dubious, untested judgments and see how my presence and thoughts are met in real time. I want to see their consequences play out. I'm reaching out. I've understood myself enough, and now I see the means for connection. Talk to me talk to me. Oh, talk to me in French. Talk to me in Spanish. Talk to me in your made-up language. Doesn't matter if I understand it. Talk right in my ear. Tell me your secrets and fears. Once you talk to me, I'll talk to you and say, hey, let's get out of